Welcome to the Tarantula Collective. My name is Richard, and if you enjoy species-specific care and husbandry videos like these, then please be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. And don't forget to click the notification bell and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any videos that I upload in the future. Now this tarantula was probably the first advanced old world tarantula that I ever added to my collection. I was very nervous and had it for a few years before I decided to add a few more on. I wanted to make sure I had its husbandry down very well. I waited even longer before making a video like this because I wanted to make sure I was putting out the best possible information that I had available to me. As with any of my husbandry videos, I always suggest you use it as just a starting point. Learn from my experiences and the things that I know and then go on to other channels and other websites sites and other message boards and, and try to get as much different experiences as you can so you can provide your tarantula with the best possible husbandry. The Omothymus via Lesepes, formerly of the Lampropelma genus, is known commonly in the hobby as the Singapore Blue Tarantula. This is an old world arboreal tarantula that comes from Malaysia and Singapore. Being an old world tarantula, this species is known for having a very painful and medically significant venom that can cause muscle aches and spasms, pain in the joints, headaches, nausea, and severe pain around the area the venom was injected. This species is highly suggested for the more experienced keepers, not only because of their potent venom, but because they are extremely fast and grow to have a leg span of over nine inches. This species also has more advanced husbandry needs than a typical old world tarantula. While females have bright blue, almost purple legs with a bone white carapace and tiger striped abdomen, males will mature out with a golden greenish color all over with extremely long legs, but a smaller sized abdomen and carapace. So the species does exhibit sexual dimorphism, making it very easy to tell the mature females and mature males apart. The Singapore Blue can be a little more difficult to keep due to the need of higher humidity and warmer temperatures. Now I keep my spiderlings in a basic arboreal spiderling enclosure filled halfway with damp substrate and provide some small branches and leaves. They typically stay hidden in their burrow as spiderlings, but will come out late at night to hunt if the prey doesn't walk right in front of their burrow. This species will act much more like a fissorial tea at this size than an arboreal tea. The substrate that I use in my spiderlings enclosure, I keep damp, and I also have them in my spiderling nursery that keeps the temperature at about 78 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. For juveniles, I will use a basic acrylic arboreal enclosure, but will set it upside down compared to how I set up the normal arboreal enclosures. So the longest part of the enclosure is at the bottom. I fill the enclosure up about one third to halfway with damp substrate. I use a mixture of cocoa fiber and topsoil with a little bit of sand, and I make sure not to let the substrate get too swampy. You have to keep an eye on the condition of the substrate to avoid mold and fungus growth, as well as mite infestation. Letting the substrate dry out completely for long periods of time can lead to bad molts that can be fatal. I provide a piece of cork bark for them to climb on, but they typically stay burrowed at the base of the cork bark and only venture out and act arboreally late at night. This species usually webs up the entire base of the enclosure and mine made curtain webs up both sides of the enclosure all the way to the top, which made it very difficult to see them as well as get the enclosure open anytime I needed to feed them or fill up their water dish. For my adult, I house her in an Exoterra Mini Tall, which is 12 by 12 by 18 inches, or the Small Tall would also work, which is 18 by 18 by 24 inches. I fill up the bottom completely with the same mixture of substrate described earlier that I use for my more moisture-dependent species. I keep the substrate damp by watering it, much like you would water plants. I don't miss their enclosure as I find that it does not provide adequate humidity or keep the substrate moist enough to meet their needs. This is an ideal species for a bioactive enclosure as there can be issues with mites and fungus that would easily be resolved with springtails and isopods. 
I plan on rehousing mine soon into an Exoterra small tall style enclosure that will also be bioactive. Now this species is a monster when it comes to feeding and will take down prey voraciously. I feed my spiderlings one or two small crickets or roaches at least once a week and pre-kill them if they're much larger than the tea. The mine will easily take down prey their own size. I wait about three to four days after a molt before attempting to feed them again and remove any uneaten prey within 24 hours. It is important to spot clean the enclosure and remove any legs or leftover bits to cut down on mold and mites. For juveniles, I will feed them two or three medium crickets or one large cricket every two weeks, and sometimes one or two more as the tea gets larger in size. When mine were around two to three inches, they had no issues overpowering and eating large crickets. Again, it is important to keep the enclosure clean and remove all uneaten prey as soon as possible, and clean out boluses and old molts as the damper substrate and more humid conditions can lead to problems with mites and mold very easily. For my adult, I will feed her between 6 to 10 large crickets every 3 to 4 weeks, or a couple large doobia roaches. I also have used superworms and green hornworms, and she has eaten them all without prejudice. About once a year, I will feed my adult female an anole or feeder house gecko, especially when she is looking a little thin a month or two after a molt. It is not something that I would film and share publicly, as it can be brutal to watch. And it is extremely important to clean up the leftovers when they're finished, as it will quickly rot and not only smell bad, but will become a breeding ground for all types of bacteria, mites, molds, and hosts of other nasty things. This species is stunningly gorgeous and can be very mysterious. I can go months without seeing this tarantula and only know it's still alive by the molts it leaves in the water dish and the boluses from digested crickets I find on the substrate. This tarantula still acts fossorially as an adult female, but when it has been dark for a few hours in the room and the house has been quiet for a while, she will venture out to drink from her water dish and walk around the floor of her enclosure. If I am quiet and don't disturb her, she will then slowly begin climbing the branches and sides of her enclosure, exploring around and hunting for prey. It is very difficult to film this behavior or even get pictures as she is photosensitive, so once the lights are on, she will quickly dash for cover in the nearest dark corner. This tarantula is easily startled and is quick to throw up a threat pose and mine has even slapped the ground a few times when I continue to bother her after her initial threat. I give this tea a wide berth and respect her space once she begins to act offensive because there is no doubt in my mind that she would try to bite me if provoked. It is important to point out that as dramatic as this behavior is, it is not a sign of aggression. They are not aggressive teas in my experience. They would rather run for cover and hide when they feel threatened. But if that isn't an option for them or they feel too exposed to turn their back and hide, they will exhibit this behavior as a form of defense. She isn't showing me a threat pose because she is aggressive. She is using it as a defensive measure as she feels threatened and sees my presence as an aggressive action towards her. So anytime my tarantulas are agitated or upset, especially this species, I will leave them alone for hours or even days before going back to finish watering or feeding them. If you are careful, mindful, and respectful of the tarantula's space and have an understanding of what the tarantula is trying to communicate with this defensive behavior, then there is a very slim chance you will ever get bitten. Now, rehousings can be tricky because they are a very fast and bolty tarantula and will always try to run for cover anytime they feel exposed. But if you use a large tub to put both the enclosures in, use catch cups, straws, paintbrushes, every tool you have at your disposal to safely rehouse a tarantula, and you're very careful and mindful, there's not much of a risk of the tarantula actually getting loose. But it is important to understand that they can jump and run very fast. But luckily, all of my rehousings have been fairly uneventful. There's very few other tarantulas in my collection that are as beautiful and striking as this one. And part of the magic of having this tarantula, one of the most exciting things about it, is that you don't see it for months at a time. And then that one night, you'll walk downstairs and there it will be on the enclosure, completely stretched out in all of its beauty. There's just something about going long periods of time without seeing something that makes it just that much more special when you do see it. 
So if you don't have one of these in your collection and you've got some experience with old world tarantulas, then you certainly should consider it. This is definitely one of my favorite old world arboreals and I don't think your collection of old worlds would be complete without adding this one. Well, if you enjoyed this video and found it informative, then be sure to hit that like button. That means a lot to me. And it also helps future keepers find this information further on down the line. Make sure you subscribe and share this video with your friends. And if you want to support this channel further, we do have a Patreon. You can find that link down below in the description. If you want to know what's going on with me in between these videos, then feel free to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. You can find links to that down below in the description, as well as on my website, thetarantulacollective.com, where I have all the the social media platforms I'm on linked right there at the top. Oh, there's even a store where you can buy all kinds of Tarantula Collective merchandise. Well, as always, it's been a lot of fun hanging out with you. I always appreciate when you guys show up to watch these videos. Hopefully I'll get to talk to some of you on the Facebook group, but if not, then I will see you next Tuesday.